My name is David Tilly. I'm the Public Information Officer for the Plano Police Department. Welcome and thank you for coming out tonight. I hope we are able to provide you some information that will be worthwhile. Many of us travel, we go to different places where gatherings occur. Um, heaven forbid anything like this ever happen, but we're gonna be providing you the tools that hopefully you will be able to use in the future in the event that you're placed in one of these volatile situations. All right, we're good to go. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, you've been thanked a whole lot, but I just wanna add my piece in there to it too. This is one of the coolest things that I've ever been involved with since I've been a cop. You know, when, when you learn how to be a police officer, I think all of us secretly dream one day we might go to an active shooter situation and we might be the officer that's able to save the day. But unfortunately, it takes time for us to get there and you all can take actions yourself to try to protect one another, protect yourself and survive. And that's what this training here tonight is about. Very briefly, I'm gonna give you kind of a roadmap for where we're headed tonight. Start with is kind of an overview of active threat science. What we're gonna teach you tonight is not just based on my opinion or the opinion of the police department, the opinion of the Plano Fire Department. This is actually stuff that comes from folks that do research and really study what is it that we need to do to try to reduce body counts in active shooter situations. After that, we're going to go into victim thinking. Everyone that is involved in an active shooter incident or really any kind of disaster, they go through three stages of thought. And we're gonna talk about that and how to quickly move through those stages so you can get to the point where you can make a good decision uh, that will hopefully save your life or save someone else's life. After that, I'm gonna to talk to you about the specific strategies that you can use in an active shooter situation. And that's our slogan. You guys got that little pocket card whenever you came in. It talks about run, hide, fight. And we're gonna go into what each of the strategies are within run, within hide, and within fight. And finally, you are in for an absolute treat when Jared Barker from Plano Fire Rescue comes up here and does his presentation on bleeding control. And he's gonna teach you not only about how to control bleeding in an active shooter situation, but in any situation where somebody is suffering from life-threatening bleeding. And it's a great presentation. You'll learn some uh, really good tactics from that. And we'll conclude with a question and answer session. One of the things that you'll notice throughout this presentation tonight is I will never mention the name of one of the suspects that has committed an active shooter event. And we'd ask you also partake by that rule. Some of these folks, they will commit active shooter incidents and they have a, a goal of some kind. They've got some reason. They were not treated right by the world in their eyes. And so their goal was to wreak havoc and kind of go down in history. And we're not gonna to contribute to that in any way by naming them, so we'll ask for you to uh, please do that. Basically, active threat science comes from two big sources. So we've got the United States Department of Homeland Security, and they put out the program that's called Run, Hide, Fight. Who before today knew about Run, Hide, Fight? Okay, a lot of people did. So then there's another source of information from Texas State University called the ALERT program. ALERT stands for Active Law Enforcement uh, Rapid Response Training. And it is basically to teach us, public safety professionals, how we should respond to active shooter situations. And they have a program called Avoid, Deny, Defend. The good news is the programs are very similar. So uh, was anybody, anybody heard of Avoid, Deny, Defend before tonight? So a few people, it's not as well known. And that's the reason that we utilize the slogan of run, hide, fight, because it has a little bit more notoriety, more people know about it, but both programs are the same. There's no differences really in the tactics. So whatever slogan sort of floats your boat, whatever memory tool you can utilize to remember the strategies that we teach tonight, use that. But this is kind of where this science comes from. Tell you a little story about where the idea for this event came from. Um, Jared Barker, Scott Mallon, Chris Patterson, Kerry Reyes and I, we went to a conference at Alert down in San Marcos. And uh, we went to lunch one day and there were really two themes of that conference. One had to do with tactics related to us and another one had to do with educating the public. And our, our teachers, our trainers at that conference said, you've got to go back to your communities and teach the citizens what they can do while they're waiting on police to arrive, while they're waiting on fire to arrive. And so that's where the idea behind this program came from. And we're very excited to uh, provide it for you. 
Just an overview of active threat science. Really the modern era of how to respond to active threats, active shooters, started with the Columbine shooting in April of 1999. And uh, you know, what, was the, what was the big deal that came from Columbine? Don't wait. Absolutely. So it was don't wait for police. Police did exactly what they were trained to do at that time, and that was they arrived in great numbers. We set up an excellent perimeter. We locked it down, and then we called the SWAT team and waited for the SWAT team to mobilize and get out and then go and try to address the shooters. Well, that takes a lot of time, and unfortunately, a lot of people died as a result of those tactics. So in the law enforcement profession, we changed the way that we do our business as a result of Columbine. And now, any time that police respond to an active shooter situation, they go immediately to the threat. And one of our incidents that we had here in Plano, one officer responded, he went immediately to the threat and stopped that threat right away, did not wait for backup. While we always want to try to wait for backup, that's something that an individual officer, that's a decision that they make to try and protect and help you, but we go immediately to that threat. We don't wait anymore. Next major incident that changed the way that we as public safety professionals in general to include both the police side and the fire side respond was Aurora, Colorado. And anybody remember what the big issue was with Aurora, Colorado? So the big issue there was waiting for medical help, absolutely. So the police got there, they found where the shooter was, they quickly took care of business, but then there was very poor communication between the police department and the fire department. And so folks were inside and literally bleeding to death without any assistance because police and fire weren't talking to one another, they weren't communicating well. That is absolutely not the case in the city of Plano. Um, you saw both of our chiefs come up and speak. We have a fantastic relationship. We train together, we go to conferences together, we come up with crazy ideas together. We are very much a together Team Plano uh, sort of program. And so the result of Aurora, Colorado was this process of utilizing unified command by both the police department and the fire department. So as soon as police leadership gets on scene, as soon as fire leadership gets on scene, those folks get together, they start sharing ideas, sharing communication. How are we gonna solve this problem? What resources do you have? These are the resources that I have. They develop plans and we get people evacuated much quicker. So that was really what we learned from Aurora, Colorado. FBI did a study in 2013, and the average active shooter situation, or 70% of active shooter situations, are over in five minutes. How long is five minutes when you're involved in a gun battle? An eternity. An absolute eternity. So we need to help you know what to do during those five minutes. When police get the call, and this is nationwide, a nationwide average, our average response time is three minutes. So here in the city of Plano, we have a priority one response time goal of less than five minutes, and very frequently we beat that. I guarantee you, any time that a cop gets a call to respond to an active shooter situation, that is what we are born and bred to do. We want to get there. We want to get there absolutely as quickly as we can. Plano's a big city. There's a lot of traffic. And so sometimes it takes a little bit of time, and there are things that you can do during those three minutes while we're responding to try and save yourself or save someone else. Survivable gunshot wounds need surgery. They need surgery quickly. What did we see as a result of the shooting in Las Vegas? How did a lot of people get to the hospital? Trucks, beds of truck. You know, some civilian out there actually stole a truck, hotwired it, started throwing injured people in the bed of the truck, and then drove like hell to the hospital. And it saved lives, okay? We have people taking Ubers, people taking taxi cabs to get to the hospital and that, that helped get those people treatment. It also causes some other issues because one of the things that the fire folks do extremely well is they communicate with the hospitals and they say, hey, I've got X number of patients, I'm coming your way, where do I go? Obviously when folks self-transport, that kind of throws a little bit of a wrench in that, but that's a good problem to have because people are getting treatment. At least they're getting to a hospital where there's more uh, assistance available to them but they need, they need surgery and they need surgery, surgery quickly. So what I hope to impress upon you tonight as we continue to go through this is that your actions matter. You're not helpless. You have the opportunity to help yourself and to help others. So let's talk about disaster thinking. And this really applies not only to active shooter situations, but it applies to really any kind of critical incident that you might be involved with. 
like a fire, for example, if you're involved in a, you happen to be in a fire, an earthquake, something like that, particularly active shooter incidents as well. Folks start out in denial, then they may move into uh, deliberation and then ultimately come up with a decision and decide what to do. This topic really came from uh, the la a lady by the name of Amanda Ripley. And she was a reporter for Time Magazine. She covered uh, the September 11th attack and several other high profile attacks. And she started to notice some similarities between people that survived and people that died. And it was really interesting to her. So she got together with some psychologists, some sociologists, some neurologists, and they looked at everything involving human behavior and why is it that some, post, some folks live and some folks die and they came up with uh, these, these three stages. So denial, the first stage, really in, in five easy steps, swallow your emotions, ignore your intuition, reason away the evidence, pretend all is well, and rinse, lather, repeat, okay? That's denial. It's a creative kind of denial, not a like, you know, no, I don't have an alcohol problem kind of a thing, but I hear some, some pops and some cracks it's February 3rd at 3 in the afternoon. That has got to be fireworks. I'm just sure that that's fireworks. Those have got to be indoor fireworks inside of my office building. Absolutely not, ladies and gentlemen. Those are gunshots. If you hear gunshots, we need you to interpret it as gunshots and then take the appropriate action. So when you're seeing something that is not quite right, we want you to act on that and not try to reason it away because it's uncomfortable for your mind. So what does this have to do with active shooter events? Well, if you start hearing gunfire, what do you do? Turn and look and see what other people are doing. If they aren't doing anything, then that may increase the likelihood that you won't do anything. If folks start running, they start making a plan, that may increase the likelihood that you're making a plan. So we can educate the folks in this room to utilize these strategies that we're talking about, and you can force multiply by going out, and if you're ever in a situation like that, leading others, helping others to make the appropriate decisions. Deliberation's that second stage, so we had denial. And the point of deliberation, we've realized there's a problem, now what do I do about it? And if we've got a plan in place, we've already thought about it, we've mentally rehearsed it, it's easy to access that plan, it's easy to execute that plan. But if, are we very good at developing plans on the fly to deal with somebody shooting at us? Probably not. Are we very good at figuring out how to jump up and run out of this room right now if we had to, if that exit over there is blocked where we all came in? How many folks sitting here have realized that there are tons of exits from this room? Both sides, absolutely, very good. I got you thinking, fantastic. So we've got exits all along this wall, we've got exits all along this wall, we've got some mysterious doors in the back that we don't know where they go, but they might go out of here and those are the kinds of plans that we're asking you to de develop. That's the kind of situational awareness that we're asking you to have. Basically, this graph is real simple. As your heart rate goes up, your stress response becomes worse, it becomes more difficult to think straight. When your heart rate gets up above 150 beats per minute, certainly up above 175 beats per minute, things start to happen to your mind. It slows down, it doesn't work quite right. Only the automatic stuff happens. You get tunnel vision, auditory exclusion. You start to not be able to see, not to be able to hear all the things that are going on in your environment. So it becomes more difficult for you to develop a plan or exercise a plan unless you've already got one intact. This slide here really simplifies everything about physiological, psychology in the brain. Over here on the left, you've got autopilot. This is the lizard or reptilian brain, all right? Fight, flight, or freeze. And this fight is not the, the fight that we're talking about at the end of run, hide, fight. This is just swinging arms in not necessarily an effective way, doing whatever you can think of just immediately in the moment, or running, or even worse yet, just freezing and doing nothing. The middle part, the limbic system, that's where the brain stores memories and habits. Memories and habits. And that's what we want you to have. We want you to walk into a restaurant 
walk into a movie theater, walk into a school, and know how you came in, but know an alternative way to get out. So that if the way that you came in is blocked, you can get out in that other direction. And we want you to think about that. We want you to think, how would I respond if there was a shooter over there? What would I mentally do so that it's easier for you to access in an emergency? How many folks, whenever they fly, they listen to the flight attendants? Liars. <laughs> you're drinking, you're reading your magazine, right? You gotta listen to those flight attendants. Every single time I fly, and even though I, I mentioned Southwest earlier, I fly Southwest a lot, you know, they, they, sometimes they spruce it up and they, they tell their story in a little bit different way. But literally, I think about it. Where am I sitting? If I'm back there in row 14 or 15, I know that that wing exit is closer than the exit in the front. I know that if something crazy happened on that plane and somebody was up there in front of the cockpit and they were trying to do something silly, I might grab a book that I always carry, put it in front of my chest and run toward that guy and tackle him. And hopefully my other passengers would help me out. Is there a reasonable expectation right now when we fly in the United States that if you act a fool on a plane, you're probably gonna get tackled? That happened after 9-11, right? We knew that. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, that is not a reasonable expectation in an active shooter situation. Active shooter suspects expect that when they walk into a room and start shooting, that people are gonna freeze, or they're gonna get under a desk, they're not gonna get attacked, they're not gonna get challenged. If we can change that mindset, if we can let active shooter suspects know that we are going to fight, and that if you show up here, you come into my restaurant, you come into my movie theater, you come into my school, that I'm gonna fight against you, I have a plan and I'm gonna exercise it, is that gonna reduce the kind of terrorist incidents that we have? I think it will. And I think that's the power that you all possess. If you'll utilize these strategies, get other people to utilize them as well. The Station Nightclub was designed to funnel people in through the entrance and onto the dance stage. It was a nightclub where there was dancing. And so this design was really good for funneling folks in, but it was horrible to get people in or out quickly. And what's very unfortunate and tragic in this situation is only about 10 or 15 feet away from that was another exit right here off of the main bar. But folks didn't know that that was there, probably because of a situational awareness standpoint, maybe because of an intoxication standpoint, but they didn't have the plan to exercise to try and save themselves in that situation. What are all these right here? Also known as improvised exits, okay? You can get out. This is also a tough slide to look at. What do you think these numbers represent? Dead bodies. This number right here in the center, this is 31. 31 people died right there at the entrance. Some were trampled to death, some died from smoke inhalation. A lot of folks died because they couldn't get out and they were trapped, but they had an exit right over here. Ladies and gentlemen, in practically every restaurant that you visit or any place that serves food, where is there almost always an exit? Kitchen, absolutely. Where do cops like to sit? Facing the door and close to the kitchen. So we can see if there's any rats and we can get out. <laughs> we can also keep an eye on those servers, see if maybe they do something to our food. <clears throat> Always whenever you walk into a location, ladies and gentlemen, know what your exits are. Know how you came in and have a, at least a plan B in terms of how to get out. So we know about what deliberation is. We know a little bit about the stress response how, if I don't have a plan, or if I do have a plan, and I'm trying to access that in my memory, how am I able to do that when I'm all jacked up on adrenaline? Combat breathe, calm yourself. Who in here knows about combat breathing? I see a number of uh, former or current servicemen and women in our audience. Thank you very much for your service. Round of applause to you folks. Four seconds is the number that I have up here on the slide. If you can't do this with four seconds, change it to three, change it to two. Take a deep breath, four count in, hold it for four counts, four counts letting it out, hold it for four counts and keep that going. The number doesn't matter. 
What matters is, is that your concentration is shifting from all this crazy stuff in the environment that you're having a difficult time controlling to your breathing, something that you can control. You can always, always, always control your breathing. And if you can do that, that will slow your heart rate down, allow you to better interpret the information in your environment, allow you to easy, more easily access your plan. Try to shift your emotion. What can we turn fear into? Action or anger. Can we get mad at these people? Absolutely, we can get mad at these people. That can help us set our mindset, help us remember the other people that we need to go home to. So we can shift that emotion away from fear into anger and something else. Obviously, fitness helps. Fitness helps in a lot of situations. It can help you better physically respond to a situation, help you think clearer as well. Deliberation, we can most quickly get through deliberation if we script, or this is that mental rehearsal that I was talking about earlier, and that's just the process of thinking, playing the little what if game. And I'm not asking you to walk around and constantly be in fear or you know, constantly be coming up with these plans to, to execute if something were to happen. But think about where you work. When you walk in to work, if you could take two or three minutes and think to myself, what would I do if this happened? And that way you're just that much better prepared. I guarantee all of us could probably spare two minutes of FaceTime with the iPhone or the Android and take just a little bit of time to think about what we might do if it really went south, at least in the places that we go to most often. You go to the same grocery store every time. Do you know where the emergency exits are in your grocery store? Do you know where the AED is? You know what you would do if a shooter came in and started going down the bread aisle, for example. Just think about those things from time to time. It will really, really improve your situational awareness. The next best thing that you can do after scripting or mental rehearsal is actually practicing that plan. Who in here is part of an organization that participates in a drill, an active shooter drill? Not very many hands going up. Just a few. How many of you that are still working uh, participate in fire drills at your organization? A lot more hands, that's very good. But those drills will help you prepare, help you perform in those critical situations. So if your organization that you work for is not conducting any kind of drills, maybe that's a conversation to have with your supervisor. Ask a question. Hey, is it possible for us to do some drills? Call us. If you're in the city of Plano, we'll help you with some ideas. Rick Rescorla is really the master of scripting and practice. This man is an absolute hero. In 1993, Rescorla was Vice President of Corporate Security for the Dean Witter Morgan Stanley Company when the World Trade Center was bombed the first time. He led the evacuation that day and stayed in the smoldering building for 12 hours helping firefighters rescue trapped survivors. After the terrorist attack on 9-11-2001, Rescorla again led the evacuation of the World Trade Center. He was last seen going upstairs into the burning building conducting a final sweep for survivors. He was killed when the South Tower collapsed. His actions that day saved more than 2,700 lives. Why was he able to run in to the South Tower on September 1st, 2011? He knew where he was going. He knew what he was doing because he had done it before. He had practiced. He had been there. Why was he able to provide so much help the first time the Trade Center was bombed? because of his job. His job was over security. I guarantee you he thought about what should we do as a company, what would I do if certain things happened, and he was able to perform the way that he performed on that day because he'd thought about it, he'd made a plan. That's what we're asking for you folks to consider. This uh, next audio clip video that I'm gonna show you is from the Miracle on the Hudson. The pilot on this US Airways flight displayed some of the absolute best calm thinking under pressure, he got through deliberation very quickly and decided on a plan. Take a listen. Uh, Cactus 1539 hit first through thrust and both hits returning back towards LaGuardia. Okay, uh, you need to return to LaGuardia. Turn left heading of uh, 220. 220. Tower, stop your departure. He's got emergency returning. 
Is that not the guy that you want piloting your next flight? That guy knows what he is doing. He has read the manuals. He knows the checklists. He considered his options. He asked about Teterboro. He asked about New Jersey. But when he made a decision, he stuck with that decision. What's interesting when you really listen to that, that video is even the air traffic control folks, they, they were in denial whenever they were hearing what he was saying because a couple of them didn't even hear that he said he had bird strikes, that he lost the thrust in all engines, and that he was going to be in the Hudson. They had to repeat that stuff. But he knew what he was going to do, and his actions allowed this flight to land with only injuries. Nobody died when they landed in the Hudson. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about active shooter events now. We've talked a lot about victim thinking, and we're going to talk about the specific strategies behind run, hide, fight. So what is an active shooter or active threat event? You've heard me use those words a little bit interchangeably. Active shooter is a word, it's a phrase that is here to stay. It's not gonna go anywhere. But really at the academic level, we talk about active threat events because not everybody uses a gun. But that's, that's a very common term, so that's what we use. And it's just somebody that for some reason wants to kill a bunch of folks. Active shooters really have no profile. There is one demographic that really is overwhelmingly consistent, and that is they're male. We, we don't have that going for us, guys. Uh, they're almost all men. Every once in a while, there will be a uh, female involved, but that's usually in a partner-type relationship, like San Bernardino, California, for example. But they're almost all male. Active shooters in general have some reason, some wrong that they experience that they want to right. They have an avenger type mindset. And from time to time, they will broadcast their intentions some way, somehow, through social media, through changed behavior, through some kind of an outcry. But sometimes there's nothing, like Las Vegas. There was nothing, no indications that have really been uncovered in that situation. So this is one place where you can help us. You are our eyes and our ears. When you see people that you work with, that you live with, that you go to church with, or something like that, and you see a change in behavior, you need to let us know. Hey, man, this guy, he posted something kind of weird. I don't understand, I don't know what's going on, but can you look into it? That gets it on our radar. So if you'll report that, those of you live in Plano to us, those of you that are from somewhere else to your jurisdiction, that gets it on the police radar. We can investigate. We can do a threat assessment and try to figure that out. That's one way that you can tremendously assist us. This map shows active shooter incidents from 2000 to 2014. Little dots, zero to four victims, medium dots, five to nine, big dots, 10 plus. What's the point of this map, ladies and gentlemen? It's pretty much everywhere, okay? It's everywhere. This is not a reason to be afraid, this is a reason to be prepared, okay? City of Plano, I absolutely love working for the city of Plano. I love living here for a period of time. Don't live here anymore. My wife wanted a shorter commute, I blame her on that. But uh, city of Plano is an extremely safe place. 
but you need to be prepared when you go here, when you go abroad, when you go any place. And that's what we're trying to help you with today. Unfortunately, we have even had our own incidents here in North Texas, as was mentioned earlier. Picture of the Dallas Memorial from last July, 2016. And then our two incidents that we had here in Plano. Since 2000, there's been over 200 active shooter incidents in the United States. So it's something that we need to be aware of and be able to respond to. A lot of people believe that schools are where active shooter events happen. And they do from time to time, and they certainly make the news because it doesn't compute. Babies are not supposed to get killed. It's very hard for us to digest. It attracts a tremendous amount of attention. But the facts are, ladies and gentlemen, most places where active shooter events happen are in places of commerce, places of business. Schools come in number two, right around 25%, but the most likely place for an active shooter event is in a place of commerce. Outdoors, another follow. Another thing that a lot of people believe is that active shooters always have a connection to the place where they commit their offense. While that's true just a little over half the time, it's also not true a lot of the time. Excuse me, the Orlando night uh, Pulse nightclub shooting is a good example of that. One of the things that, well, first I'll ask you a quick question. What time of day do active shooter events happen? Trick question. They happen when police are not there. That's the time of day that active shooter events happen, when we're not there. There's video of the Pulse nightclub shooter pushing a stroller that we now know had a uh, doll inside and probably had a rifle inside that he ended up using at the Pulse nightclub shooting through one of the major theme parks in Orlando, Florida, earlier in that day. And there's video surveillance of him walking past a group of uniformed officers, just like we have standing around the outside of the room right now, seeing them and him grimacing. You can see him become angry. And he thought, this is not the place. This is not the time. So for whatever reason, he wound up at the Pulse nightclub. But they don't always have a connection. And that's a very important piece of this slide. The number of deaths at active shooter incidents really are a product of two things. The first is how quickly we arrive. And what's the national average response time? Three minutes. Outstanding. Y'all are doing well. And then the second piece of it is, is how many targets are there that are available? So the strategies that we have, run, hide, fight, reduce those numbers of targets and will help us reduce body counts. Again, we hit on this response time. So our slogan, run, hide, fight, or avoid, deny, defend, whatever floats your boat, that's what we want you to remember. All right, we're starting to get into a little bit more of the exciting stuff. On the next slide that I'm about to play, you're going to hear some gunshots, okay? The purpose of you hearing these gunshots is for those of you who might never have heard them to know what gunshots sound like, okay? That's the purpose. No one is going to shoot. No one get freaked out, but there will be some gunshots. What followed each one of those gunshots? Shell casing. So that was probably a semi-automatic weapon. Person was firing, shell casing emptied, shell casing fell on the ground. That was what the clanking was, okay? That doesn't sound like fireworks, folks, all right? And that's what we want you to hear, is know what the sound of gunfire is like, and if you think you hear gunfire, then treat it as such. At the Plano Police Department, one of the most frustrating calls for us is I think I heard gunshots in the area, and the next line is 10 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago, and I'm like, what are you doing for 10 or 15 minutes? Call us and let us know so we can go and we can investigate. That's deliberation and denial right there. So if you hear it, act on it, okay? So we can do our job. Hide is the next portion of our little memory aid that we have for you. Run, hide, fight. But it is not, ladies and gentlemen, hide and hope. Hide, hope, and do nothing. If you get into a situation where you're hiding, we want you to be thinking. 
what's my other exit option? What am I gonna do if the shooter comes by? But don't just hide under a desk, okay? We're gonna talk about a situation where that was very unsuccessful here in a little bit. All right, ladies and gentlemen, run. When, if you can run and you're able to avoid that shooter, that's what we want you to do. We're not asking anybody in here to try to attack or confront a shooter in an active shooter situation unless that is a last resort option for you. If you can run, if you can avoid, then that's what we want you to do. Utilize one of those two exits that we know. As you're running and you're running out, you're likely to encounter us. And like it or not, folks, we have to make literally a fraction of a second decision to determine if the person running toward us is friend or foe. This is the universal sign of I am not a threat, okay? Why did I just set down my little clicker? You, me, being a cop, as I'm looking down the sights of my Glock when I'm running toward you, am not able to quickly process, remember, I go through deliberation too, is that black thing that's in your hand a gun? a clicker, a cell phone, or whatever. So this is the universal sign of I am not a threat to the police, okay? Utilize this whenever you see one of us and you're running out. It will help us out tremendously. Leave your belongings behind.